Oh, it's you. Welcome back to the Wanderer's Library. Couldn't stay away, could you? Don't worry, I'm only teasing. Come, walk with me. We'll go to your little spot. There's a nice collection of stories there today. Pay no mind to the others. They won't bother the chief archivist or his guest. These mandibles aren't purely for show, after all. Regardless, it's a nice day in the stacks. Plenty of tales abounding. I've spent hours cataloging them today, and have happened to cross more than a few gems. Care for a story or three while we walk, friend? Excerpt from the transcribed journals, manuscripts, and letters of Lady Juanita del Rio. 3rd June 3004, or thereabouts, keeping time while traveling is difficult. Darling Mira, you've asked for more stories from my other journeys, so that's what I've decided to write about this morning. Here, I'll tell you of a most curious cult I've come across in my travels. From what I can tell, the immortal monks of the Great Plateau worship no deity. The entire focus of their cult is on study of the self. They need not rely on great numbers of converts because they possess a curious technology with which they replenish their numbers. When a convert spends a year within a monastery or a slow caravan, a concept I shall further describe below, having proved their devotion to the strict rules of the cult, they are asked if they would like to remain with the priesthood for the remainder of their days. If a convert answers in the affirmative, a surgeon, every monastery or caravan typically has at least two, alongside two physicians, will take samples from the convert and then medically sterilize them. It's much easier to remain celibate if one does not possess means of intercourse. Here, I will also mention that persons of both sexes are admitted into every sect. The immortal monks do not recognize gender and address each other in a word best translated as sibling. The bodily samples of the new monk will then be taken to a refrigerated section of the monastery or to a special electromotively cooled motor cart of the caravan, where it shall be preserved for purposes that I will eventually make clear. The new monk is then tasked with writing an autobiography, describing their life in as much detail as possible up to the moment of initiating the autobiography. From there, the monk's primary tasks outside maintenance of the monastery, entails studying the history of the cult and authorship of a daily diary. Each monastery or caravan has as many schools wherein monks are taught the necessary tasks for upkeep of their own sect. So the typical day of an immortal monk proceeds thusly. At sunrise an alarm sounds, waking all within the sect. Every monk is asked to spend a few moments writing about their dreams or passing thoughts from the night prior. Then the monks convene in whatever dining area they possess, when a short mantra is uttered. There, they all help in preparation of the day's breakfast, usually a hearty sort of porridge that has fruits within it when such are available. They eat quickly and quietly, help each other with the washing, and then set about their individual tasks. If a sect cares for livestock, those will be tended to first, usually by the entire membership of the sect. The craftsmen and mechanics and carpenters will then set about repairing furnishings within the campus. The technicians will set about their secretive tasks. The tailors and weavers will go to their workshop. The archivists will go to their library. The missionaries shall scout the path ahead of the caravan or set out towards the nearest village or city of trade. Motor cart drivers will set the caravan into motion and the elders of the sect shall discuss various decisions that must be made within the sect. I will mention here that every sect of immortal monks will always have some children with them, who are cared for by a caste of monks referred to as educators. When the sun is highest in the sky, an alarm sounds, and all monks make their way back to the dining area, where they all speak a short mantra and work again to make their porridge, this time served with bread, cheese, meat, or some other source of protein. Upon completing their luncheon, Whatever monks still have tasks to complete set about them. Usually these are few and far in between. The monks with no specialized tasks to complete help with the livestock and the crops, then all convene in the library, where special electric tomes are studied. I shall detail the contents of these tomes soon. Approximately an hour before sunset, sometimes later in more northern climates and earlier in late summer, 
The sect's elders will call all monks within the library to the dining hall where reflections on the events of the day are shared and decisions for the sect are announced. Upon conclusion of this meeting, a third mantra is uttered. No monks I asked were willing to translate these mantras for me. And supper is prepared, usually consisting of cheese, bread sweetened with honey or fruit preserves, and wine, though sometimes there is beer or meat. All monks will then return to the library and resume their studies until approximately two hours before sunset, when a fourth and final alarm sounds, and the monks retire to their quarters. The monks usually write about the events of the day in their journals, before finally laying down to sleep. The slow caravans of the immortal monks are a curious thing. Each is a monastery in itself. Upon the roofs of the dozens of motor carts are black tiles I am told can take the very power of the sun and turn it into electricity. I was skeptical at first, but every motor cart within the slow caravan has electric lamps and all manner of power appliances. The slow caravans are called such because the caravans forgo established paths and only move a mile or less a day. Each motor cart within a caravan serves a purpose. The forwardmost motor cart houses the sect's missionaries, who act as scouts and surveyors in addition to their role of communicating with the outside world. The following cart normally houses the oldest monks within the sect, as well as a small meeting hall within which more important matters are discussed. Following the elder's cart are the general housing carts containing bunk rooms for every member of the sect and usually some room to spare for guests. These are followed by the library cart, which can seat every member of the sect with room to spare for texts. Next is the dining cart, which is typically quite large and can easily seat every monk in addition to holding a kitchen large enough to cook food for the entire sect. Then there are food stores and usually several farm carts with open roofs to let sunlight in for the crops followed by livestock carts and motor carts for every other conceivable need the slow caravan might have. Special occasions within a sect are common. If a guest, such as myself, is in the midst of immortal monks, they'll be cared for and shown much of the sects, and indeed much of the cults, inner workings. If you have items or currency to trade for their hospitality, they'll accept it, but will not demand it. If you are knowledgeable in some skill or other that's of use to the monastery and offer your labor or wisdom, they'll treat it much as a physical item for trade and gladly accept it, but again, do not demand such. They often have ample quarters. Many monasteries and slow caravans seem to operate on a skeleton crew. Many people go to the immortal monks as guests and become converts. I nearly befell this fate, but I have a mission and must complete it. I cannot do so within the halls of the immortal monks. Final initiation of a monk, typically signified by a bodily sample being taken and their bodies being surgically sterilized, is a cause for celebration where all but the most vital of tasks will be seized and the higher quality wines or liquors will flow freely. The death of a monk whether natural or through happenstance, is a somber occasion. At a monastery, the monks will exhume the oldest corpse in the graveyard, usually quite thoroughly skeletonized, move it to the monastery's catacombs, and then bury their fallen sibling in the newly opened grave in silence. These graves have stones, but the gravestones bear no name, merely a plot number. In a slow caravan, the body will be taken to the cooled motor cart for temporary storage, while the sect waits for the missionaries to return. When the missionaries return, they will be tasked with learning the local funerary customs. If the deceased can easily be honored as locals, they are. If they cannot, the medical motor cart has a crematorium, where the deceased is cremated, again watched on by the monks in silence. The ashes will then be stored until a locale is found where the urn can be interred without disrupting local culture. Here is where I must state the purpose of bodily samples of every mortal monk being stored indefinitely, and thereby where the name comes from. This shall also explain the presence of children within every sect. Every sect of the cult possesses means of growing a human fetus from a small cell sample. I was told of these electric wombs, but not permitted to know their actual location within any monasteries or slow caravans. This is why the sample is taken upon final initiation to the cult, to create an immortal life without permission of the first, to possess the cell line is considered a great heresy by all immortal monks. But upon death, 
an immortal monk is guaranteed to be revived in this way. After ten months of gestation within these electric wombs, infants are born, identical in every way to their predecessor. They'll be raised within the monastery until they're fifteen years old or thereabouts. Some sects wait until a person is twenty-one, or only thirteen, whereupon they will be offered to resume their old position within the monastery. Most guests of the immortal monks who learn of this path to immortality become monks to achieve it, and most persons born within a sect accept the offer as they know no other life. The electric tomes studied by every immortal monk contains their first autobiography, as well as every journal they've kept throughout their many lives. However, an occurrence I've witnessed on some occasions while visiting various monasteries or traveling with slow caravans is what some immortal monks call the final life. The average life of an immortal monk is approximately a century. If, in all of that time, an immortal monk cannot read all of their many autobiographies, their next incarnation will not be offered a permanent place within the sect, instead being given the best education the sect can offer and being sent out with a copy of their electric tome and whatever possessions they can carry with the next batch of missionaries. This event is by far a more important event than any funeral held by the immortal monks. The final life of an immortal monk is when the fantasy of immortality the monks anchor themselves to is shattered. A monk leaving the cult, especially one who did not complete their study of self in the most recent past life, is cause for a bittersweet celebration within a sect. Speeches and documents detailing the monks' contributions to the monastery over their many lives will be shared, wine and tears will flow, gifts will be bestowed upon the former monk, and a great many embraces will be held on their final night within the cult. It's strange to think that these people are both centuries old and mere younglings. They are cast from the only home they know to a strange world that will not understand the true weight of the former immortal in their presence. I saw this ceremony once on the northern ridge of the Great Plateau. The monk was a woman of unclear ancestry named Wilhelmina Michaels. This particular slow caravan had allowed her to stay as a student of their mobile university until she was 21. She was quite the mechanic and had a way with the bees kept aboard the caravan. She was nervous about her departure, but the elders of the monastery and her educators seemed quite confident she would do well outside their halls. As it happens, on another trip that took me through the same region some years later, I ran into Wilhelm and a no longer a resident of the Great Plateau, but of a small village west on the Northern Ridge. She was very valued in her community, having helped rebuild the power plant and devise an alternative fuel scheme far cheaper than imported diesel or kerosene. She said she sold her tome, undoubtedly countless centuries of journals, invaluable wisdom from bygone ages, to a university student studying the history of the immortal monks. I highly doubt it holds as much value to them as it did to Wilhelmina's. She goes by Billy now, she told me. Previous incarnations in their desperate ploy for both immortality and deep self-understanding. Definitely an odd bunch, but I am no longer young. As my mission draws to a close, I am tempted to offer myself up to a passing slow caravan. Take me! Oh, immortal monks, for I fear death and would offer my twilight years for a passing chance at your mechanized reincarnation. Ha! Wouldn't that be a curious end to my travels? Dearest Amira, I wish you could join me on my seemingly never-ending mission. Perhaps someday you will. Until then, I will update you on my travels. Never forget that I love you. J. Statues by Snapdragon and Rounder House. We are statues, you and I. The halls of the library are filled with statues, from the smallest figurines and busts to towering sculptures and graven images. The history of our people is intertwined with that of the library itself, our home. Every shelf of the library is dedicated to a patron who has contributed to the collection or the culture, and what better way to show that dedication than their likeness set into stone. This is how we began. I know not of whose likeness I am carved in. I do not have the memories, the knowledge, the identities of whatever wanderer the library chose to honor forevermore. I was simply birthed into consciousness one day, 
with this simple instruction, watch over your shelf. And that instruction I have executed without a moment of weakness or distraction. From my perch at the front, I observe all who come and go, memorizing their appearances and purposes. Save for myself. Without a mirror, my form is a mystery to even me. All I have are fleeting glimpses, collected over the decades, of myself in a patron's eyes, in their bronze shields, in their glossy clothing. I treasure the memories closely. These are likely the closest I will ever have to a conception of myself, my appearance, who I am. I am perched on a platform. From there I can see you, a portion of you, your full body is obscured by the mahogany of your own shelf. But I see a slice of your form, beige and indistinct. We have been neighbors for centuries, yet never so much have seen each other in our full. I can move when no one is around. Nothing prevents me from walking over to see and speak to you, who have lingered just out of view for as long as I can remember. Presumably so can you. But we don't. Your reservations do not bother me, and, by appearances, the feeling is mutual. We were birthed to protect our shelves, to protect the library. What else is there for statues to do? We are similar, you and I. We only noticed by chance. It was a quiet time in the library. There is no true day or night, but every so often the sky darkens and dims, and pinpricks of light appear where a roof should be. They dance around and around, forming constellations that wanderers have gone on to write treatises cataloging. I enjoyed watching these pseudo-stars. It was a pleasant reverie from the monotony of guard duty. But I heard a crash and turned my attention back down. It took but a moment of investigation to conclude what I already knew. It was not from my shelf. I would have noticed if something had been out of place in my domain. Yes, this was a different shelf, and a different statue's problem. Then I saw it in front of me, a hideous feathered creature weaving in and out of your shelf. A magpie doing what magpies are fated to do. Lie and steal stories, sowing chaos in the library. They were banned long ago, but keep finding their way in, pests that they are. The nearest docent was at a distance. I prepared to summon it, when suddenly, the magpie is stilled. A large, concrete fist crashes down upon its skull, almost as if the swirling stars above sent a meteor down to our little section of the library. But no, that fist was connected to a full statue. To you. Every glance of myself in a holographic helmet or silver fang coalesced in you, a perfect image, idealized. Did you see me? Your beautiful, painted eyes don't move. Neither do mine, I think. I hope you didn't. I hope you did. We are dancers, you and I. In all my centuries, I have never considered leaving my plinth. The shelf behind me was all I knew and all I cared to know. Seeking knowledge, something greater, that wanderlust is not for those of my ilk. That is what I believed. The first time I came to see you, it was migration day for the Cromwells, and many of the patrons had departed from the usual perusing and musing to watch the flocks. I was sure I had the stacks to myself. I looked down. I can sense my podium is only several inches above the flooring, but it seems so far. I look up. The migration must have just started, as I can see the yellow and brown plumage of the very first Cromwells soaring through the rafters. Soon enough, I wouldn't be able to see the ceiling, instead replaced with the avians. I noticed one staring down at myself, all the way at the top of my shelf. After a brief moment, it took off and joined its brethren. If it could jump from such heights and soar, certainly I could take a step. So I did. I took another, and another, and another, until before I knew it, I was standing beside you. So we stood. A perfect duo in unity. That is, until you stepped off of your podium and moved to the center of the walkway between our shelves. You turned to me and beckoned. Almost in a trance, I stepped into the walkway as well. There was no way to know what you were thinking, nor you I, but it was as if we were both sculpted from the same stone. We locked hands, 
We swirled and twirled to the music of thousands of wings flapping far overhead, both keeping an eye locked on our own shelf. Once a book was read to me where happiness was described as a fluttering of the heart, and I imagine in that moment it is the closest I'll ever be to that feeling. Suddenly we both stopped in our tracks, frozen by sight. Only a few shelves down the walkway, a young, wayward wanderer stood watching, its eyes wide and its mouth shaped into a small O. It stammered out a quick apology and ducked into a passageway between the shelves. So we continued our dance. We are in love, you and I, and everyone knows it. It turned out that news of our dance had spread quickly, assuredly attributable to the young wanderer that we saw the night before. It turned out that our dance had scraped the flooring, creating a pattern of loops and geometry, but as a docent attempted to begin replacement of the wood, a contingent of wanderers stopped it from doing so. Strange, sentimental creatures that they are. As years and years passed, the library grew in tandem with the wanderers' imaginations. The walkway between us grew a little larger, seating appeared overnight, and the day the shelf blocking my view of you shifted just a few inches to the right was the best day of all. A poet sat at your feet once, drafting an ode to our first night together. As he folded it and placed it behind my podium, a secret between us and any who could find it. Wanderers confessed to each other with the blessing of you and I. The chief archivist told us to stay dedicated to our purpose, but I could see the pride in his eyes. And the dances, neither of us could forget the dances. The soft colored lights, the living instruments, a true celebration of partnership. All who attended would turn away, allowing us to take the first dance of the night. When we were done, we would return to our respective podiums, and the patrons would take their turn, dancing along the lines we made so very long ago. It was nice to watch them, but I couldn't stop myself from watching you every time. My love for you is their love. We are in danger, you and I. I do not know what is going on. It is dark and fiery. There is smoke rising throughout the air no matter where I look. Screaming and shouting in the distance, a loud characteristic popping. As darkness fell on the library, a way opened, an unfamiliar way, a peculiar scent to it. Animals rushed out, all black hair and reflective eyes. I cannot see you. There is a mass of people and violence in every direction. I cannot move. I am afraid. We are separated, you and I. As the light rises and bathes the library in its glow, the devastation becomes visible once again, lit in yellow rays instead of orange flames. Our shelves and two or three surrounding us had been devastated, scorch marks decorate the wood, and blood pools and swaths on the hardwood. The carpet simply soaked it up. The library did not let such things go to waste. Librarians stalk up and down the shelves, picking books up off the floor where they had been strewn into piles in the chaos. Many were missing, and even more were simply damaged. Patrons and wanderers help them how they can, only the librarians truly know how to organize the tomes, but their job was made easier by the people collecting and separating books by whether they could be salvaged, even more aided directly. For every wanderer helping, there are two on the ground, one injured and leaning against the base of a shelf, and another tending to their wounds. I am unfamiliar with the internal anatomy of living things, but I can tell the variety of the injuries here was only outweighed by the variety of those who had arrived to help. It was an outpouring of community in our home. Everyone was there, save for one. Your platform was conspicuously empty. Seeing the stone circle without you on top of it was unfamiliar. I didn't like it. This was the feeling that they call concern. I scanned the throngs of people, hoping for a stray glimpse of your stone head. None came, so I stood at my perch, ever waiting. As the wanderers passed below me, paying me no mind, I hear snippets of conversation and discussion, and piece together an image of what has happened. The jailers had opened a way into the library in the dead of night. How, I have no idea. But they had rushed in, hoping to seize this rare opportunity 
and begun taking things. Stories, textbooks, wanderers, statues. They had been quickly beat back by the Dostens and retreated through the way before it closed, and not before losing many of their men. We simply had the misfortune of being in front of them, and so the damage was done. They took you. A second later, and it could have been me, but I took no solace in that. You were, you are the first to ever make me look at myself, see myself, develop myself, and now I had lost you. All for the greed of the jailers. Over the following weeks, I withdrew. Back to how I had started, a cold stone exterior guarding my shelf and myself. I grow bitter. Troublemakers in my territory quickly felt a stone presence behind them out of the corner of their eyes. You were a fighter, I knew that. The jailers may have taken you, thrown you in a cell, but they could not keep you. I would wait for you, no matter how long it took. You would fight and scream and violate however you could until you had your freedom back, until you could escape your containment and return to me. A Traveler in Time by Vigil the Shaper I sit before the Jinni, hearing the sounds of the jailers coming closer. I ask to live forever, and he replies with the pains and torments of loss. The loss of loved ones, the loss of home, the loss of future. Without a moment, I accept. With a quiet blink, I find myself in the past. Hello, world. I am stranger in a strange land. I have no skill in making anything useful, not with the tools of this age, and my body is ill-suited for hard labor. I decide to go from farm to farm until someone is willing to give me simple work that can be communicated without words. At least my regeneration will help me recover quickly. I am kicked off a farm almost immediately. Within an hour or two, it was obvious that I am slower than a ten-year-old child at this time and the farmer has no desire to share his hard-grown food with this oddly garbed, weak-limbed creature. I have learned two words which I believe mean barn and piece of shit or something of that nature. I cannot pronounce either, but I repeat them as I walk. I am near a city and the farms are blessedly close. Even so, it takes close to a full day before I find another farm that allows me to do some work. My benefactor this time is grizzled and careworn, yet I think he is touched by my helplessness. I work a few hours and eat for the first time the flavors strange and bland to my palate. My vocabulary gains a few more words, but most of the communication is through hand gestures, though even that is surprisingly difficult. I sleep in the barn, rain dripping through the slats, keeping me awake long into the night. I had the good fortune to arrive during planting season. As I grow accustomed to the work, I feel I am less of a burden than I was at first. Perhaps I am, even, barely, earning my keep. But, more to the point, my vocabulary is improving considerably, and I am now speaking in short, simple sentences. The summer is busy for me. I know I cannot stay here. After harvest, I will need to find other accommodations. I know that learning to write is of the utmost importance, but there are no books to be found. Instead, I slowly, painfully copy characters I see written wherever I find them, practicing them with the burnt ends of sticks on rock until I can form them quickly, even if I do not know their meaning. My benefactor, who has the habit of occasionally looking on as I practice my writing, surprises me one day we are in the city. He introduces me to a man whose function I do not really grasp, but who seems to be some sort of clerk. In any case, he is willing to write out some sentences and tell me what they mean. His accent is new to me, the vocabulary is strange, and I drink it in. This man has some education. I use my charcoal collection to write the translations in English, and he asks what language it is. I have no answer, so I tell him I made it up. He laughs. For many nights after, I copy these passages again and again. 
I visit the clerk at every opportunity. The farmer is understanding. He is kind and seems to care about me. But I also see relief in his eyes that I will not ask to stay the winter. The clerk has become a friend, and he willingly supplies me with new words and corrects my fledgling script. Luckily, the script is simple and rather flexible, much simpler than English, and my progress is rapid. My writing has become quite serviceable, and well that it has, because the harvest is done and the preparations for winter have begun. I still work much of each day, but soon I will need to find new accommodations. The clerk, who it turns out takes dictations from the wealthy and illiterate, helps me find a job doing inventory and bookkeeping for a successful shop. It pays so little that I can scarcely afford to house, feed, and clothe myself, but I have ready access to quill pens, and now my real work can begin. On wood, stone, and any other surface I can find, I begin writing down everything I remember. About textiles, manufacturing, mathematics, psychology, history, and medicine, I write in English and in great detail, developing a shorthand for my relative certainty about these facts. Over the next several years, my education proves invaluable. The owner of the shop, at first scornful of my work, becomes if not a friend, then at least an ally. I show him how to reduce inventory carrying costs using lean economic techniques and predictive forecasting of purchasing trends. I introduce a formal loyalty program, employ relatively sophisticated product pricing strategies, and he is generous in rewarding me as his wealth burdens. The clerk is happy for my success at first, and I even try to help him, but the role reversal does not suit him well and we stop spending time together. When he dies a few years later, I don't even know. The farmer I visit occasionally. It is awkward, but I owe it to him. The shop purchases most of what he produces at a good price, and that is perhaps the only meaningful thing I give to him before he dies quietly, eight years after I arrived. It is during this time that I sow the seeds of wealth. I save every coin I can and found an informal bank. I am allowed to operate out of the shop owner's buildings in exchange for a fifth of the profits. He is skeptical at first, but it costs him nothing. By the time the shop owner dies nearly 30 years later, it is more than half his annual earnings, according to the quasi-accounting team I now employ. I purchased the business from his widow for a sizable sum, sufficient to keep her in comfort for the rest of her remaining years. It takes time to find and train someone to handle the day-to-day -day management of the bank and the shop, still known as such though it has expanded a dozen times and offers the finest and most varied wares in the city. But once accomplished, I turn my attention to my new project, a university. I pay to build it, but the ongoing costs are covered by the students, mostly the children of the obscenely wealthy. I need to be careful. Some of my ideas could draw the wrong kind of attention, but I begin rigorously training them in the scientific method, drawing on every elementary school experiment I can remember. I find I enjoy this. Aside from some dalliances, I lead a fairly solitary existence. The children make me feel connected, meaningful. It is time to deal with the issue of not aging. I establish a bank and university in two cities, perhaps a month's journey away from each other, and begin passing myself off as my own son or grandson. Every twenty years or so, I rotate, managing the affairs of the other location by correspondence. Some of the students have grown up and become teachers. This is both heartwarming and inconvenient. Much of my knowledge is no longer mine alone. I have good paper now, just one of the many fruits of my universities. I publish a book of prophecy in which I attempt to capture all of my recollections of science and phrase it as if they were clever guesses. This is perhaps all I can do to guide and hasten their progress. I continue to write down my memories, but I have not remembered anything new in a very long time. I fall in love. She is young, everybody is young when you have lived a century and a half, and she is bright and she worships me, yet speaks to me candidly and without guile. Before I ask her to marry me, I tell her the truth about who I am, something I have never done before. 
I show her the vast piles of writing, copied and recopied in an ever greater expanse, organized and reorganized, indexed and cross-referenced a hundred ways. She does not believe me. She is not cruel, but she leaves the university soon after, and I do not see her again for many years. For the first time, I contemplate death. Impatient with the rate of my progress, I use my wealth and prestige to forge a political career. I have no wish or facility to run a nation, but I advise and my banks give my words weight. I do my best to resolve conflict and establish universities in every allied country. The thing I remember with the sweetest nostalgia, other than air conditioning and hot water, is television. It is a bizarre, ridiculous thing to work towards, but I throw my wealth and centuries and harness the combined intellectual power of every major nation to make me some damned talkies. It takes a long, long time. It is 750 years before the world is modern in my eyes, though history has taken a vastly different shape. We had no dark ages, no long stretches of stagnation. For all the many gaps in my knowledge, there are always brilliant minds to discover, or even to leapfrog, the reality I recorded which now seems like another man's writing. I assume different identities now, controlling my enterprise through elaborate mechanisms of separation. My personas are primarily political. As I continue to try to guide events, I succeed, though less with every passing century. I wonder, sometimes, if I should let loose the reins. Now that I have nothing to offer other than my accumulated wealth. It is my 900th birthday, to the best of my reckoning, when I set foot on Mars. It is already lightly colonized and nearly everyone is there to greet me. Late that night, I step out of the airlock in my suit and for the first time in centuries, I am captivated, utterly transfixed. The night sky is blacker than I ever imagined, the stars fervent pinpricks of light. My suit protests as I remove my helmet, the sounds of my gasps intertwining with the sounds of the alarms. I lived longer than any other man could have, I suppose, my cells eagerly rushing to right themselves. But soon, I meet the same end as everyone I have ever known. I try to remember the face of the farmer the clerk, the shop owner. I try to summon the face of the woman I loved, but cannot. Indeed, I find I can remember nothing at all worth remembering, as if I had slowly consumed their meaning over the endless years. Goodbye, world. And that's all I have for you today. Come, you look. What's the word? Ah, sleepy. Have my stories bored you such? No, no, I just... It's quite alright. You little things need your rest. Hop off, this is the place. Wonderful, isn't it? A nice little nest to cozy up in. Go on and drift off. When you wake up, you'll be able to find your way back to the main hall. Just pick a direction and start walking. Until then, good night, wanderer. Restful dreams.